So uh, thank you for coming to session one. So uh, we will we will start the final LT and closing session from now. So uh, as usual, uh, lightning talk uh, will be uh, performance by five minutes, and after five minutes, I will run some sound. At, at that point, please stop your presentation. So uh, we will start uh, from Sponsor LT by Google Cloud Japan. Title is Make Your Own Coding Companion with Kodi. Uh, speaker is Tu Ya Q san <laughs> So please prepare with connecting uh, your cable. Uh, please start. Ah. Thank you so much for coming. I'm Tuya. I'm fluent from Singapore. I'm going to talk about this uh, code completion using the Kodi. Right? I'm a developer advocate for Google Cloud and focus on machine learning and AI. So, anyone talk to the element and other things before? Like, you know, bar or any other similar platforms where you have a prompt, you type in, and then you talk to the large language model, then you get better response, okay? So this is for like other things like, you know, what's my birthday, how do I get, you know, what are the things I should get for my girlfriends and things like that, right? So if you break it down, your prompts into multiple parts, it looks like this, right? You have the instruction, you have context, and then, of course, you have the response. Right? In this case, the response is shorter because you are trying to summarize something. It's the same for coding, right? So coding, with Kodi, you are still putting in the prompt and the Kodi will give you the code. And of course, not give you your birthday wishes. It will give you code. So this is how it looks like as well. You have the code and the prompt. You still have instruction. You have context. So in this case, I'm generating Python code. And then I will also want to write it in Python and do PEP8 style guide, right? So this is the response back from the model. So it's fine-tuned to give you the code that you would use in your day-to-day -day work, right? So currently, it's the API. So you can actually integrate this API into any of your work, right? Could be your website, could be your mobile apps, could be anything that you dream to be because it's the API. You can just assume it and then use it. Is that there are a few things. Completion, which is like auto-complete for your code. You want to generate the whole piece, you can also do that. And you also have a multi-turn chatbot to like ask more about the code, ask it to improve, change the variable names, or add comments and things like that. You can do that as well. Right? You can also check whether the code is actually, you know, if you copy from GitHub. Has it been any complication with you and the license that's provided? So you can also do that with the recitation chattings and other things. Right, there's some demo that I have. So I'm going to just switch over to the other tab. So this is how it would look like if you are using Python. Right, I'm using Jupyter Notebook because data science people use that to run it. So you just have to put in like prompt, write a Python function to do binary search, and then you just import the model, right? So you don't train the model, you don't upload the model, it's just the API call using the SDK, right? You just say predict, and then you pass in the prefix. So the response looks like that, right? Binary search with the commands and the arguments and returns, and also, it provides some checks, whether the array is empty, whether the middle of the index is the array, things like that, okay? So you can also do it for like Golang, Java, and standard SQL as well, right? So it depends on your use case. You might not just use for Python, you might use for other things. And if we want to control the response, so just now I just asked it to write a Python function, so I didn't define other things like what's the function name, what's the variable name, uh, how many test cases that I want. You can define it in your prompt and say write a Python function, name, calculate cosine similarity, and then it takes in vector one and vector two as the variable. And you can use numpy dot function. So I'm even influencing how the operation is gonna be inside the function to create it, right? So I just had to put in this prompt the same way that we use, 
and then it will create cosine similarity based on the name that I put in the prompt. And then it will name my variables at vector one and vector two, just as I want it to be. And then what it difference is, is also use the numpy dot operation to calculate the two. Okay, and it's also produce unit text directly. So unit text here, cosine similarity text for positive, and then text for negative, and so on. Right, uh, and you can also use this as like a template where you have for uh, application already, and then you use this to you know uh, create some of the things that you want. So let's say you want to generate different functions for different languages. You have just put a variable like what type of language, what type of format, what kind of extraction, what are the requirements, and then you just create a one uh, string using those variables and you can change the variable. It could be user input, it could be something that you generate yourself. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. So uh, next next speaker is Nai Nisan San Nan I'm I'm quite sorry. <laughs> no problem. Uh Nisantha Nantakumar. Thank you. Test with confidence, a deep dive into eliminating flaky test in Python. So please start from now. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today we're diving into a crucial topic that often goes unnoticed, but is significantly impacts our developer user experience. It's flaky tests. So tests are the backbone of our development process, ensuring our software works as expected. Uh, but what happens when these tests aren't reliable? So today I'll be discussing how to find your flaky tests and how we can eliminate them. So my name is Nisanthan. I'm a senior software engineer at Sentry. And let's just keep going. So what is a flaky test? It's a test that can return different results, pass or fail, on different runs without any changes to the code. Uh, what causes this unpredictability? Uh, there's three reasons. Asynchronous code can sometimes execute in unexpected sequences. Race conditions, where the output depends on the timing of uncontrollable events, and environmental factors, like differences between local machines and CI. Uh, the saying inconsistent results erode trust in a testing system encapsulates our challenge. Without reliable tests, our faith in the entire testing process goes down, and the danger isn't in the false positives, but is the time wasted chasing down false negatives, or false alarms, sorry. Um, so my goal is to automate the flaky test detection. So the approach is to automatically retry failing tests. And if they pass on the retry, it hints at potential flakiness. And we're going to report that to Sentry. Uh, so uh, we're going to use PyTest rerun failures plugin and retry five times for the system. And so a quick code prototype. Uh, we're going to import uh, Sentry SDK. and. In PyTest, uh, if you're building a plugin, they have this uh, hook called PyTest run make report. And this executes all the other hooks to obtain the report object. Next, we want to skip, uh, avoid skip calls, and create this attribute called like Sentry exec chain. And this is where we're going to store all of the failures. And when the test pass, uh, we're going to go through all of those like stored failures and create the exception, right? So put together, it looks like this. But you don't actually need to do any of that work because we built a plugin called PyTest Sentry. And you can just install it and run it in your CI and start collecting data immediately. Once you have all this data, we need a query for our flaky tests. So use Sentry dashboard. And it, this is actually like an internal screenshot of the stuff that we do at Sentry. And if you look carefully, not only are we recording flaky tests, like doing this system for our, our backend Django uh, stuff, but also for the front end, React and JavaScript. So this actually, this approach is pretty language agnostic. It works for any uh, language and testing framework. And so best practices to 
uh, fix your flaky tests. Evaluate your test value. So sometimes like the actual value of the test may not be worth the effort to fix the flaky test. So you might as well just like skip, modify, or delete it. Uh, tests should live in their own bubble, untouched by external states and other tests. So PyTest fixtures provide this by allowing you to set up prerequisites and cleaning up after tests. So for example, if you're building a database uh, feature, a uh, fixture can create a fresh database instance and tear it down post-test. And also consider uh, mocking external services and dependencies. That way your tests aren't relying on external system state or availability, eliminating an entire category of flakiness. Um, your test should be laser focused on individual functionalities. If you find yourself writing a test that checks multiple functionalities, it's a cue to split it up. So ensure tests are pretty singular and well-defined and maintain distinctiveness between tests. Um, timing can also be a flakiness culprit, especially with integration tests. So instead of arbitrary weights, monkey patch to generate timestamps or date times to emulate certain conditions. And lastly, differences between local and CI environments are a classic source of flakiness. So strive for parity between them. So use tools like Docker. And when, you're, when you require external interactions, think of ways to minimize variability. And this could be achieved using local stubs or fixtures to simulate external calls. Um, identification and best practices are just the start, but monitoring is our safety net. So with Sentry's dashboard, not only are you keeping an eye on your application issues, but also any lingering or emerging flaky tests. It's an ongoing process, ensuring that our code base remains trustworthy. Uh, thanks for listening to my talk. Uh, any questions? I don't know. Perfect timing. Let's go. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. And uh, third person is Niharika Badiruri. Some. Hmm? あれ、一人飛んだ。一人飛んだ。飛んだぞ。うん。ニハリ。ああ、オッケー。ああ、ありがとうございます。オッケー。で、こんなってたら。はい。まあ、こう、こういうこともだいたい起こりますという。はい。
in hot summer days and day and night without any automation happening there. So when I went to an event, uh, one of the person came up to me and asked, so as an engineer, what are you doing? Why should there's, there be some company coming up and telling you to build this, build that? Why are you not yourself implementing something to improve your country and your own economy? So this is how we came with an idea called as AgroBot, and so that's how the inspiration came up. So we decided to build a bot uh, I and one of my other friend, which is, this is the 3D KiCad model where you don't need farmers. This uh, particular bot will do the whole work of uh, trying to gain the soil analysis as well as what kind of crop is suitable to grow on a particular soil. So this is the concept and working of the whole uh, bot. And it is doing two things. The first thing is navigation and the other thing is sensor data acquisition. So navigation is, uh, in, in the sense, uh, it is trying to understand what kind of surface is this. it is, like is it a rocky terrain or is it a smooth surface, something like that. And then it is giving the data to image processing and that we are doing through OpenCV. And then uh, it is doing sensor data acquisition, that is analysis, and it is done through sensors, temperature sensors, moisture sensors. So it's going to take the data and almost this is how we got it in OpenCV when we wrote the whole code in Python. So we got the grain analysis, this is how it showed. And through this, uh, we tried to understand what kind of uh, land it was, what kind of soil it was. And then uh, this is how we differentiated in uh, the types of soils that are uh, easy to grow, which kind of uh, crop is suitable for what kind of soil. And uh, yeah, uh, so this is the, uh, 3D KiCad model, and that's the economical prototype. It's almost like, uh, I would like to show you how probably it can be done. So this is, uh, okay, yeah, can you see the video? So the farmers, uh, they grow and they try to sow the seed and they do everything this will done, this uh, bot will try to do. Uh, using like, it will, it will just uh, sow the soil, it will even uh, try to, um, so, so, so I mean, it will even try to put some seeds into it or something like that. So almost uh, everything is done on based on open hardware, uh, sensors, data, acquisitions, and uh, models. So um, yeah, so th that is how. That's how it is. Uh, the idea is to completely build, and uh, probably uh, many countries like India and uh, countries where uh, the population is huge. Uh, it's not, not every time uh, we, we have different companies coming up. It's us engineers uh, who can do something and we get the support of government. And through that, we uh, kind of try to do the stuff. Uh, so yeah, uh, this is my topic that is agrobot. So probably just to reduce the manual labor uh, that, uh, that probably uh, takes a lot of effort to do. Uh, replacing that with technology is what uh, the aim was. And that's how it, it runs. Uh, so yeah, that's my topic. Yeah. Thank, thank you for your presentation. Mm -hmm. Ah, hi. えっと、<笑> では、
イラストレーター支援のための個人活動をしていて、もう、えー、と過去に2度ですね、イラストをテーマにした、えー、と発表を Python で、Python でさせていただいています。で、今回で3回目になります。はい、それで、過去の登壇にですね、こんな質問を受ける機会が何度かありました。イラストレーターって、イラストを描くとき、脳内のイメージをそのまま絵にしてるんですかって質問ですねあの。ちょっとこれ勘弁してほしいんですよね。そんなことできる人、めったにいないんですよ、実は。ほとんどの人が描きながら少しずつ完成形のイメージを構築しているんです。で、イラストの制作フローっていうのが、まあ、一般的に5段階あるんですよ。えー、まあ、えっと、最初に何を描くかを決める着想っていうのできっかけになって、で、まあ、ラフをこれでガシガシと描いていって、きれいに線画を整えて、で、その線画をもとに着彩していって、最後に仕上げの調整をするみたいな流れのものをするんです。この5段階をたどりながら、イラストレーターはね、少しずつ、えー、完成イメージを自分の頭の中でも、イラストの中でも構築していきます。えー、このなその中でも、えーと、特に色を塗るとき、この色を塗るときっていうのがすごく重要なんです。そのときに、イラストレーターは自分の完成イメージをぐっと、あのー、構築することができるんですよ。なので、そんな色を題材に、今回はまあ、初歩なんですけれども、色選びの話をします。まあ、色選びって言ってもね、なんか、経験とかセンス必要なんじゃない、難しそうって思うかもしれないんですけれども、安心してください、奥さん。えっと、経験とかセンスとかに頼らずに、えー、今回はもう、Python を使ってね、えー、色選びをしてみましょうということで、今回はその事例を持ってまいりました。まあ、事例って言っても、僕が好きなキャラクターを書いただけなんですけれども、はい。えっと、まあね、えっと、条件として、その事例は、えっと、まあ、えっとまあ、とにかくこれキャラクターを描くってことでモチーフは特定のキャラクターですでモチーフが決まったらもう色選びも始まってますまずモチーフをじっくりと観察してどんな色で構成されているかを把握しますそしてモチーフの色に合った絵作りのためにイラスト全体の色、まあ、モチーフからイラスト全体の色を、えー、っと絞り出しますそんな時に、えー、よりどころにできるのが、えー、っと色彩調和理論というものなんですけれどもまあちょっとそれは詳細は省きますが、色彩調和を計算するオープンソースって結構いろいろあるんですよ。で、まあ、たくさんの色彩のね、あの配色パターンっていうのが出力されるのですごくアイディア出しに便利なんですね。で、いろんな可能性がそれで無双で,無双できます。で、色彩調和に整って、えー、まあ、乗っ取ってうまく絵作りすれば、大抵ね、不思議なんですけれども、ちゃんと映えるイラストができるんですよ。本当にね、約束された勝利の配色が事前に分かるってめっちゃすごいんですよね。はい、これ、絵描くけどやったことないって人は、ぜひやってみてほしいです。はい。で、それから、ラフの段階じゃなくて、今度は本格的に色を塗り重ねていく段階の色選びっていうのでも、あの検査できます。まあ、その一つとして、えー、例として、えーと、モチーフに光が当たった時の名部と暗部のシミュレーションです。まあ、それは、えっ、ー、と、なんだろうな、えー、っと、光源のスペクトルが決まれば大体ね、えー、それってざっくり想定できるんですけれども、まあ、ざっくりですね、えー、本当はもう光の輸射角とか、えー、っと、オブジェクトの質感とか、いろいろ複合的なものを見ないといけないんですけれども、今言ったやつも全部シミュレーションできます。なので、まあ、気になる人は、とりあえずね、あの手ごろなオープンソースとか触ってみるといいと思います。そして、一通り書き終わった後に、色全体のバランスを確認できると、さらにいい、えー、っと、安心です。まあね人間ってね、その日のメンタルとか、あと、年を取るとね、どんどんね、色の弁別能力が低下していくんですよ。なので、自分のね、感覚を過信せずに客観視するっていう習慣がすごく大事だと思ってます。はい、そんな感じで、今回は色と Python を題材に、イラスト制作の事例を紹介しました。まあ、理屈が分かれば、イラストのレーター目線のコードって結構書けるんで、皆さん、やってみてください。あと、ここの場で言って、今日いいのか分かんないですけど、振り込み出ます。はい、<笑>ありがとうございました、えー、広瀬さんどうもありがとうございましたそうネクストスピーカーズチャンサウイーさん<笑> please, 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 please connect your computer to the AV <笑> so the, the next is ソニーバルデズさん
今日今日意外と結構セッション会場で AV トラブルが多発したようでちょっとあの非常にあのなんでしょうド,ドキドキしながら司会をやっているんですがもと,もともと1時間のセッションで LT プラスクロージングで5分が10人っていうことは50分ですよねっていう。いやそのじその時点あ映ったようですのでこちら側で全画面スライドショーを開始してもらってはいはいはいあねネクストスピーカーイズチャンサウイーさんあタイトルイズ How many iPhones does it take us that does it take to see a new Python version あ、uh, Please start your talk Thank you あ、uh, さっきフライングしてしまってすいませんえっ、ー、とサウイです、um, I'm an engineer at Henge、um, based in Japan So, in the past, I've climbed up、uh, Mount Kiniranjaro, tallest peak in Africa.、Um, so, if I've COVID, I finished my first full marathon last year, but it's my first time attending PyCon, so I'm very excited to be here today.、Uh, well, thank you.、Uh, um, so, one more question What is the difference between an iPhone mini and, I, and an iPhone Max, if anyone knows? Okay, I'll just go.、Uh, size of an ego, I think. <laughs>、um, well, jokes aside, I think even if you're not an iPhone user, you know the new iPhone 15 new is coming out, right? Like titanium and all that. But、um, it doesn't really happen for Python, right? Like 3.12 came out in October 2nd, but not all of us know s what's going on, what's the difference between 3.11 and 12, or no, 5 and 6. So I, I try to dive a little、uh, into that. And, Um, came up with some answers. So, but a primer first on、um, Python versioning. So, the latest version is 3.12.0, as many of you hopefully know.、Um, 3 is actually the ma major version, 12 is the minor version, and 0 is the micro version. So, to use very crude iPhone、um, analogies, major is like going from an iPod touch, if you remember that, <laughs> to an iPhone. So, very, very dramatic change, very different things. Minor is like, oh, new iPhone, okay, titanium, very nice. Micro is, oh, new from iPhone color. Now you have like military green. So, yeah.、Um, and, but there are very、um, similarities. <laughs> so,、uh, some similarities between Python and iPhone, as I found out. So, on the left, everyone knows that guy, Steve Jobs. On the right,、um, many of you know that's Guido Van Rossum,、um, founder of Python. He was the ben benevolent dictator for life、um, at the Python community until 2018 when he stepped down. And by the way, he's still alive. Um, next, um, next similarity, cadence is all the same, like iPhone, there's a new one coming every year, we all know. And Python, actually, there's a new one every year, right?、Uh, 3.12 just came out, that's our Py,、uh, Wi Fi password at the venue as well. And a pro tip,、um, I was chatting with someone at the Henge booth just now, he was saying, oh, we use 3.7. So, quick math, if you add 3 to the 3.7, you know, that's like, oh, he's using iPhone 10. Yeah. Right.、Um, so, some differences as well. So, Apple culture, we all know, is very secretive. There's some rumors before WWDC, but you don't really know what's going to come up. But for the Python community, it's very transparent, it's very community driven. Everything is on GitHub, everything is、um, written as a PAP,、um, Python enhancement proposals. So it's all、um, open on the internet, and a PAP takes like, from several months to like, sometimes more than a year to get accepted or like, rejected. Right. And when it comes to the number of people working on Python、um, at Apple, when I checked, they have 164,000 full time employees. Obviously, not everyone works on the iPhone, but、um, about 100,000 people working on it, I guess, with the factory people and all that. And for Python, it's actually just 85、um, active core developers,、um, out of which five were elected to be the steering council. So they are the ones who have the final say on whether they want to accept or reject a PAP. And、um, obviously, you have、um, other people in the ecosystem, like library maintainers. So I'll say about 100 people work on the Python version, right? And then finally, when it comes to life cycle,、um, Apple, you know, Apple Care, one, one year, <laughs> three years if you're lucky, right? Python um, um, is designated to have a five year window,、uh, support window from the first release to the end of support. So, and libraries usually kind of retire support six months after the official deprecation, right? This is a very、um, easy to understand chart. So, every, for, most of the time, it's very nice, five year windows, except for 2.7, which lived for 10 years. Uh, so, it's still kind of haunting us sometimes. And also,、uh, conclusion how many iPhones does it take to ship a new Python minor version? So, depending on how you measure it, it can be like、um, one new Python version equals one new iPhone, or an, an one thousandth of an iPhone, or like about two new iPhones. So, thank you、uh, for listening to my talk. h e n g e is hiring. Please drop by our booth. Thank you.、Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chan san, for your pr funny presentation. So,、uh, next, next speaker is、uh, actually、uh, Sony b a r d i s a n but、uh, Koi Hoge san will present for,、uh, for them. So, you, 
ではご用意くださいあ後ろに,後ろに座らあの立たれている方前の方とか結構空いておりますのでぜひあの前の方までお座りくださいって言ってもやっぱり最前列とかなかなか行きづらいですよねはい。OK。OK、uh,。The presenter Sony Barres was unable to、uh, attend due to visa issues.、Uh, instead, we will stream five minute video that he sent. OK <laughs>。<laughs> What are flashcards? Flashcards are used to help remember words and or pictures. They are helpful for students in memorization. Examples of flashcards are these. So, you can see, this is just a simple card, and we have some tests. Ice coffee, caramel macchiato, hot coffee, banana muffin, cafe mocha, pancake, apple pie. Do you remember all of that? Well, I hope you do. Get a sweater and check later. Some last cards have pictures on them, such as these. We have, we have apple, bee, cat, and duck. But in actuality, we don't need this, this fancy last cards. No, we can actually make last cards with just a piece of paper, such as these. See that? Just write down the text and you can do a little doodle if you want. However, we're in Python Colaferis and we want to do this in the digital world. So how do we do this? Before talking about the digital world, here are some tips for using flashcards. Number one and number two, which is very important, is that you should create your own flashcard. This is what we call a generative learning style in which you learn something new, and then you write it down. Don't forget to shuffle your cards well, and be consistent in the rhythm when thinking time. So, one, two, three, one, two, three, and so on, and so on. After you finish all of them, go ahead and recite the words as you remember, as much as you can. Then, rest up for five minutes after each session, before doing another. Let's make our code. You can find my code here at GitHub. And this is the cafe that we're trying to create. This is the last card that we're trying to create. We're trying to use a library called PySimpleDuby. So, we're going to say every three seconds, we're going to change the text. That is all this is going to do. Now let's see about how it looks like. Sorry about that. Let's try this again. Tarame Machado. Cafe Mocha. One, two. Apple pie. Pancake. Ice coffee. Hot coffee. <laughs> Banana muffin. Do you remember all of that? Well, without looking at the text, hopefully you get 100%. I'm sorry about this, and thank you for listening to my talk. だん,だんだんユニークなトークになってきましたがありがとうございます。ね、Next speaker is Hassan Saad Ifti さん。Please connect your computer to the、uh, cable. So, this is seventh speaker of this lightning talk. So, it's already past、uh, two third. So, oh, oh. So,、uh, next speaker is Hassan Saad Ilti san.、Uh, title is London to Tokyo in two hours a visual demonstration of how Python helps 
uh, scientific discovery in enabling future passenger rockets. Uh, Thank you so start. much. Thank you. So thanks for having me here. So I took this very uh, uh, 787 Dreamliner coming here from Los Angeles to Tokyo. It took uh, a long 12 hours to come here. So imagine a world where wherever you go, it will take two hours. Imagine going from London to Tokyo within two hours. Imagine a world where you need to transplant a liver. So you take uh, a liver from one donor living in America to, say, a donor living in Japan within two hours. So, so from donor to receiver within two hours. So we're looking at a passenger rocket. But why can't we do that? So if we were to use one of these aircraft just for once, it will cost a ticket, a, a general ticket, about a million dollars because these aircraft cost about 300 million US dollars. They can carry 300 people. So roughly speaking, if we only use it once, the ticket price would be a million dollars. And that's what's happening with rockets today. So let's have a look at the speeds of flight today. So when we fly today, we fly at 87% of the speed of sound. We had the Concorde that took us from New York to London within uh, three and a half hours. So that's uh, supersonic, uh, actually Mark II, so twice the speed of sound. So if you're looking at passenger rockets, we're looking at hypersonic speeds. So anything beyond Mark V, so five times the speed of sound. So what's the problem here? Why can't we have passengers, daily passengers in rockets? So the challenge we face is uh, heat. So when you have friction, it generates heat, right? So uh, if you're coming in very fast, it generates a lot of heat. It heats up the air, surrounding air. And this is actually a SpaceX capsule coming in. This is real data. Now, when they, when they come back, you can see that it's already charred. It's damaged, so we can't use it again. This is the NASA Artemis, Artemis program. It will take us to the moon, but it's not reusable. If we want to be like Top Gun, fly at high speeds, this could be a future aircraft, uh, but it will be very hot, you can see here. So these methods are not reusable, so we can only use them once. So uh, we're looking here at a new technology, a reusable technology, that's transpiration cooling. So we mimic how we sweat, so this is going to be a, a sweating rocket. So we, this is the vehicle skin. We inject some cooling gas through a porous material, and that will keep away the heat from the wall. So this is, this is mimicking our skin, so that's where we inject the gas. So what we want to understand is how this protective gas mixes with the hot gas because we want to know how much we need to carry. Because in an aircraft or a rocket, we have to know how much we carry its payload. So for that, I did experiments. So this is a hypersonic tunnel in, at the University of Oxford. So it does uh, Mark 7. So it's seven times the speed of sound for 30 milliseconds, not seconds, milliseconds. So we get real life data from these tunnels. So that's the model I'm testing there with my crazy scientist hair. Um, so I'm putting in this model. And this patch of pink, uh, say, paint here measures the concentration of gas. So I'm injecting nitrogen and helium. And I'm measuring the concentration of the gas with a high-speed camera. Remember, it's 30 milliseconds. So the camera needs to be fast. So we get a time series data block of uh, data, it's about terabytes of data really. So that matrix of data goes through several uh, uh, processing routine using NumPy mainly. So we do a stabilization, we apply the calibration pixel by pixel and get the concentration. And the, I'm going to show you the concentration in terms of relative concentration. So eta 1 means 100% of the injected gas and 0 means there's no gas anymore. It's all mixed away. So this is the real life data happening at seven times the speed of sound at Mark 7. This is real data happening. So one thing I want you to appreciate here is every pixel is a sensor. It's not one sensor, two sensor. All of the pixels are sensor. This is real life data. So what do we do here? So if I, uh, okay. So, so we take that map and then we take a span wise average and then we create line plots. And our goal is to predict this, because if we can predict this, we know the physics of it. So we come up with a fluid mechanics-based uh, hypothesis based on diffusion. And this is the physics of it. And then now we compare it to the experimental data here. 
Now you can see the dashed line is the analytical model. So this is the theoretical model. And now you can see that the, the experimental data is pretty much on top of. OK, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so, thank you, Hassan san uh, for your presentation. So next speaker is Grass Monkey san. Junbi onegai itashimasu. Grass Monkey san no tsugi, next to Grass Monkey san is Patty Wong san. Uh, please be prepared. というところで残り3人となってクロージングも近づいてきておりましたが皆さん今日どうでしたでしょうか、はい、い意外とノリがいい方々ばっかりで<笑>意外と,意外とあのいろんなところで LT の司会やってるんですけどな,んかなかなかノリが良くない良くないと乗ってくれない方とあのイベントもあったりしてちょっと辛かったりするんですがあでは、えー、と準備できたようですので、えー、とグラスモンキーさん、えー、タイトル「パッケージ管理ツール来園の旅路」ということで、えー、LT いただきますよろしくお願いいたしますよろしくお願いしますはいえー、と今回は、えー、とバリバリ日本語でいきますでもあの一応スライドは英語で頑張って作りましたが文頭はちょっと日本語になりますよろしくお願いしますで、まあ、今回のテーマはあのライっていう、まあ、パッケージマネジメントパッケージツールですね今日もなんかたびたびトークとかで出てた気がするんですけどそれのまあ紹介になりますで、えー、と自己紹介ですが、えー、と普段はまあ PHP とかを書いてて最近は Web アセンブリ使ってブラウザで PHP を動かすとかを使っ作ったりしてましたはいえー、で、えーとまあ、今回ですね、まあ、なんで今回パイ、パイコンのトーク、今回初めてなんですけども、えーとまあ普段仕事でよく使ってて、えーまあこんえー、なんか環境構築で結構苦労することが多かったので、まあ、今回ちょっとそれでチャレンジしてみましたみたいなトークになります。でそもそもライって何っていう話になるんですが、えー、まあ個人でまあ作られたものがベースになるんですがスターもだいぶも多くなって、まあ、だいぶデファクトになりつつあるのかなっていうまあラスト製のツールになります。でえー、大きい特徴としては3つあるかなと思ってて、えーまあ、ラスト性であることと、まあ、パイプロジェクトともにです、ね、を使うっていうところとあとはあんまり今回は触れないんですけども、えー、投下的にです、ねえー、VM 部を使えるみたいなところが特徴かなと思いますでラスト性であることが何が嬉しいかみたいな話で言うとですね、えーまあ、シンプルであることになるかなと思いますでどういうことかっていうとですね、まあ、環境工事がすごい楽かなと思いますあのいろいろバリエーションあるかなと思うんですけど例えば PIP 演武とえー、PIP と V 演武の組み合わせとかだと、まあ、Python 入れたりとかあとはアクティベートしたりとか、まあ、なんかいろいろあるかなっていうところで、まあ、私みたいな初心者だと結構ヒーヒー言うかなっていうところになりますであとはまあポエトリーとかっていうのもあるかなと思うんですけども、まあ、これも最初に Python 入れるリストがあったりとかで、まあ、なんか Python のバージョン何にするのみたいな結構迷うことあるんじゃないかなと思いますで一方でライだとラスト性なんで、まあ、インストールして終わりっていうのでまあ簡単でしょってやつですねはいでえー、とでまあ、あとはロックファイルもあの作,れる作られるんで、まあ、インストール時の状況再現とかもすごい楽かなと思います。まあ、あの当時でシンプルにセットアップができるんで、まあ、やったぜっていうことですね。最近だとあのやっぱ M1Mac とかあの Apple シリコンとかの登場で CPU アーキテクチャの違いで結構悩むことが多いんじゃあるんじゃないかなと思ってそういうのが少しでも減ることができるのはいいかなと思います。であとですね、えーとパイ、パイプロジェクトトムルの触り方みたいなところで言うと、まあ、パイプロジェクトトムル自体はまあ皆さんご存知かなと思うんですけども、4種類のペップで定義されているものかなと思ってます。で、えー、とそれぞれちょっと、えー、ライトですね、えー、ポエトリーの比較をしてみると、まあ、ライはこんな感じで、えー、とプロジェクトにあの基本的な環境依存を書いて、えー、と独自拡張の部分にあの開発用の依存を書きますとで一方でポエトリーは全てがまあ割と独自拡張かなっていう感じのがまあちょっと違いとしてあります。でまあ総じてそれらがえとファイルとしては別だったりするんでまあちょっとこのマイグレーションどうすんのみたいなのがちょっと疑問にあるかなって私は思いました。で、えー、具体的なマイグレーションツールが公式ではまだ提供されてないのでまあ今だったらどうするかっていうちょっと自分なりの解を提示してみるんですが、まあ、リクエスメントテクストを間にあの経由することであのマイグレーションはまあできそうだなっていうところは一応確認できましたはいでまあちょっと本来ですね今回のトークとしては実際プロダクション導入してみたらちょっと知見とか話せればよかったんですがちょっと時間がなくてできませんでしたってことでちょっとブログというか続きはウェブでということで、えー、とお待ちくださいはいで、えー、まとめになります、まああの
、えー、ライを使うですね環境構築がすごいシンプルになるよっていうのとあとはパイプロジェクトトムルっていうまあ基本的なペップに基づいてやってるんでまあスタンダードだよねっていうのがまあ安心感があるものかなと思いますであとは私みたいに Python 普段触らない人からしても、まあ、10日的に今までの Python の仕組みを使ってくれてるんですごい安心感があるプロダクトだなと思うんで、まあ、今後ぜひ使っていきたいなと思いますはいまあ、あのいろいろなんか欠けてるかなって思う部分もあるかもしれないですけどオープンソースなんでぜひ皆さんコミットしていきましょう私もやっていきたいなと思いましたはい、えー、最後に PR です、えー、採用もやってるんでちょっとよろしくお願いしますはいはい、えー、グラスモンキーさんグラスモンキーさんありがとうございました So、uh, next speaker is Proti Wong さん、uh, please, please prepare、uh, for your presentation So, the last speaker is Sojin san. Yeah, okay.、Uh, yeah, slide is now on. So,、uh, next, okay. next is, is、uh, by Petty Wang san.、Uh, title is.、Ooh? Oh, evaluation of ranking model.、Uh, please、yep. start your presentation.、Yep. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Petri Wong, and my topic is、uh, how to evaluate the ranking model.、Uh, so, who am I? I'm a machine learning engineer for search engine AI. I,、uh, I work for the、uh, Legal on Technology, which is a company h e l p users to review their contract and identify the、uh, potential risks in the contract. So, my job is to help users to retrieve contract. Or、uh, articles, or in, a, in other words,、uh, I build ranking model for, for the search engine. So, what is the process uh, for uh, building the ranking model? So, we will read the paper,、uh, get some idea, and try to build a POC model and do some benchmark、uh, many, many times, and on the, which, which is on the static data set. And after we prove Uh, our new model is better than the existing model on the benchmark data, data set.、Uh, I will do the offline evaluation several times. So、uh, we submit the query on the production data and try to、uh, retrieve the result and ask the domain expert, which means、uh, lawyers in, in our company,、um, which model is be better than the other one, the baseline model or the new, new model. And after that,、uh, if we prove it is better than、uh, the baseline model, we will try to implement it、uh, in the production environment and try to do some、uh, online evaluation, for, such as A B test. And so, what,、uh, what is the cost of the evaluation? So, the, for the benchmark, we can integrate them into the、uh, CI CD or ML LOPS. And if we will take some, something like a、uh, few minutes to one hour if the、uh, data set is super large.、Uh, for the offline evaluation, we will put the result on a web interface, or sometimes we just simply put, it, put them into an Excel file or a spreadsheet.、Um, so it will take a few hours if, we, if our law, lawyer works very hard.、Um, Or days, or even weeks, if they are very, very busy. So,、uh, for online evaluation, we, we, you, it usually to take、uh, around two weeks or more because we need to collect enough the sample size.、Uh, and we want to eliminate, el eliminate the weekday effect, so it, at least two cycles, which means two weeks. So,、uh, for the benchmark and online evaluation, we cannot help them because we cannot. Not, we cannot ask our user to submit more query into our system. And we cannot,、uh, the benchmark is fast enough, so we will not focus on that.、Uh, for the offline evaluation, so how we, it is how we will do that.、Um, so we will try to pre,、uh, have a, end preset、uh, queries and generate some result for,、uh, from different model. And ask our college, which means lawyers,、uh, to give them a score and aggregate the result and calculate the win rate. And、uh, in this test, we found that the model A is best, better than model B, but however, model B is our new model.、Uh, 
And I need to uh, go back and change some hyperparameters and generate another side set result and wait, wait for one more week. So what's the solution to make, the, um, make it faster? So the, the first solution is to ask our college to work harder. And yeah, and don't sleep, something like that. <laughs> and another one is import open AI and try to write a pump here and write a Python uh, program to fit the, our data into the pump. And it will something, uh, generate something like uh, here, uh, the score for uh, model A and score for model B in each um, query. And we cal uh, aggregate the result and calculate the win rate and uh, get the final report. And the next step will be uh, integrate this one into our ML labs and repeat the evaluation many, many times uh, with different type of parameters uh, so that we cannot, uh, our lawyer can just go to sleep. Okay, and the final one is paid view. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Peter san uh, for your presentation. So the last speaker is So Jin san Oh. So please connect your computer. こう。なんか日本人っぽい名前な感じがするけれどもどっちかわからないっていう時怖いですよね。そう。<笑> いや、なんか先ほどからあの全部でスマホでやってるんですが、あのさっき私のスマートウォッチの電源がゼロパーセントになって時計がこうピンチというか、いや前前回三三週間前の口コミで何を学んだ私はっていうはいそう、the ルいや、3週間前ペチコンでで <笑>今日また全部しかもドラもないはいえそうあザラストスピーカーズソジンユンさんあタイトルイズタイムトゥセーブシーアイタイムそうプリズプリズスタートユアプレゼンテーションあヘローアイムソジンユンあパイソンディ
So how to solve? Uh, I started looking for ways to reduce this, believing there must be a solution, and I can proudly say that I did it. Um, the CI time ha has been reduced to around one minute. Here's how I achieved it. Caching. Cache things uh, that don't change frequently. Parallel processing. If possible, parallelized tests. It's simpler than you might think, isn't it? As always, there were so many trials and errors. At first, I implemented a mechanism to detect changes migration files because I'm using Django and used caching when there were no changes. Additionally, I tried running it with the parallel option and it worked well locally, but for some reason it was breaking in the CI environment. So I ended up using this approach. As there was no need for the migration process in the test, I boldly omitted it. It's the configuration. So simple, isn't it? Migration first. And test splitting. Instead of using this par parallel option, I ran two containers in parallel. I experimented with up to five, but it didn't significantly reduce the time. So I'm currently running with two. The configuration is simple. You just need to add the following to your CI config file, in my case, Circle CI, it may vary depending on the, uh, the environment. Parallelism 2, or the desired number, whatever you want. This allows you to run tests in parallel, which can help speed up your CI process. In conclusion, the time was reduced one-tenth, and the cost also became one-tenth. You can do it too. Give it a try, and I hope it helps you save time. Um, thank you for your attention. My Twitter and GitHub accounts are as follows. Um, even though I mainly use Korean, I've been studying English and Japanese, so I hope to be able to communicate in various languages. I'm really happy to have had this lightning talk today. I wish everyone a happy day. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Soji san, for your presentation. So, a uh, series of uh, lightning talks of uh, PyCon 2023 day one is over. Uh, please give warm hand clapping to all 10 speakers. Hi, Minasan, Eto, Kyono, day one no. えっと、参加お疲れ様でした。ありがとうございます。え、今もたくさんのLT <laughs> okay, we will just wait a little while while people move between different tracks uh, because of something that will happen at the very end of the closing. So that's top secret, but you can get excited for what that surprise will be. はい、えっとですね、え、ま、yeah, so those of you who understand Japanese will now know what the secret special event at the end of the closing is. And those who don't, um, now is a good time to start uh, learning Japanese. <laughs> like, talk, talk to your neighbor, they might be able to help you.
<笑>あいえ全然大丈夫ですあのえー、とじゃあちょっとこの待ってる間ちょっとトラック1の、えー、と方しか私は見えないんですけどもトラック2も見えてるのかなあの今回パイコン初めてという方っていらっしゃいますかざっくりアンケートで。Oh. First time PyCon attendees, raise your hand.、えー、I'm not allowed to raise my hand, but. <笑>おお、すごい。半分ぐらい。ありがとうございます。なんか嬉しい。で、今回パイコン APAC としては10年ぶりですね。10年前に2013年にパイコン APAC があって、えー、とずっとパイコン JP としてやってたんですけども、今年は APAC として、まあ、アジア地域です。アジア太平洋地域。の人たちが集まるようにという思いでちょっと国際色をより一層国際色を出してやってきました<笑>大事長すぎ<笑><笑>すいませんあいいよじゃあ続けてじゃあちょこちょこ振ればいいあの漫才じゃないですよ<笑>どういったパイコンエバクは10年ぶりですわかる<笑> And yeah,、uh, yeah, we're really happy that we can, after 10 years, again host PyCon APAC here in Japan, as opposed to PyCon Japan that we do every year, which, by the way, we do again next year. Just a little hint、uh, you might want to come again. じゃあもう一個、えー、とちょっとまあ簡単なアンケートというか聞きたいんですけども、えー、と今回と、日本以外から来られた方って。どのくらいいらっしゃいますか日本以外から来られたという方は手を挙げてください。Anybody who came from outside Japan, put your hands up in the air. <笑>あれこちらはちょっと思ったより少ない。No. Not じゃあ日本,に住 Not that many here. 日本に住んでいるし。ああ、なるほど、なるほど。もしかしたらあのトラック2の方かもしれないです。が多いかもしれないですね。なので、はい。あはい、あのアンケートありがとうございます。えーとですね、じゃあそろそろ OK かな、はいはい、では改めましてクロージングパイコンエンパック2023のクロージングを始めたいと思います OK、uh, so yeah sorry for the wait and we will now start the day one closing of パイコンエンパック2023はい、えー、今回のインポータントアナウンス重要なアナウンスなんですが、えー、と英語で書いてはおりますがお詫びとご案内となりますえ本日、まあ、運営側としていろいろと準備最善を尽くしておりましたが、えー、映像配信とか機材トラブルとか、えー、と登壇さんの急なキャンセルがございまして、えー、と運営としてお詫びいたします、えー、と申し訳ございませんでした And yeah,、uh, we would like to apologize for some of the trouble that we had today with the scheduling and all of that. And we thank you for your understanding. すみません、えーと、もう一つの案内です。えー、とこれは、えー、と今日参加された方は明日も使えますので、えー、と明日参加される方は名札とストラップを一緒に持ってきてください。And I would like to add、uh, once more apologize because we forgot to change the speaker notes from last year. Anyway,、uh, please bring your lanyards and、uh, name tag again tomorrow. You will need them to get into the venue. えー、ともう一つです、ね、案内ですが、えー、と午前来た時に、えー、とノベルティのステッカー皆さんに配るステッカーが準備でき,、ね、できてなかった点がありまして、えー、と参加者全員に渡せるものとなっております、えー、お昼休みに配ってはいたんですがまだ受け取ってないもらってない方は、えー、と運営の方までお声がけください。And yeah,、uh, we, were, we intended to give everybody、um, some novelty stickers in your bag in the morning, but the stickers arrived too late,、uh, for which we apologize. And during lunch, we tried to get, hand them out to as many people as possible. If you have not gotten your fancy stickers yet,、uh, please get them at the HQ. 続いて、えー、と忘れ物、落とし物です。Okay, we have two、um, things that people forgot. <laughs> <笑> somebody, somebody lost their memory. えっとなんかこのメモリーなんで落とすのかなんかすいませんなんでなんでノートパソコンで来られる方がいらっしゃるんですが
it has a hole for it seems to be a key holder or something uh, and it was lost in East Sponsor Hall at around 4.30 if you lost your memory please uh, either come here right now or come to HQ later Number two, a very beautiful bag, a very unique bag that very few people have at this venue. <laughs> and this was lost uh, just a little half an hour ago in track three, last row, left side. I don't know left side from this view or from this view. I don't have that information. Uh, if you lost your novelty bag, please go to the staff HQ to get it. はい、こちらのノベルティのバッグ、トートバッグ、ないなと思った方がいたら本部までえっと、あの、お声掛けください。あ、続きましてえっとアンケートのお知らせです。え、こちらのアンケートはえっとデイワンデイツ含めてお一
we haven't figured it out yet. Um, and this will be in person only, not streamed, not recorded. So like a, a unique chance to experience the, those lightning talks. はい、続きまして、え、29日スプリントでですね、29 あの、入れますので、ぜひ登録の上、進めてご参加ください。And uh, as a reminder once again, there's a sprint on Sunday. Uh, it's going to be from 10 to 5. And importantly, as I mentioned this morning, this is not in this venue, but in a completely different part of Tokyo, in Shibuya. Uh, it's free to attend, there's going to be free lunch, um, but you have to register in Pretix. And again, you can do that through your order page and add the sprint option. There should be some uh, slots left. <laughs> uh, okay, and so here's the secret super special event that I um, uh, teased before, and that is we're going to take a picture. And the way that is going to work is we're going to take pictures in multiple rooms because we don't have a room that's large enough for everybody. <laughs> えっとですね、今回ちょっと会場がえっと、それほど広くないあの、区切られてますので、2階に分かって、2階って言います。ま、皆さんは移動しなくて大丈夫です。えっと、カメラマンが移動して撮影します。で、え、東方としてはまずこ